Excuse me. With that, I uh, am I'm enlightened to now uh, get us into our next plenary session with the title Transforming the Food System. What does it mean and how does change happen? And in this session we will hear about transformation from three different speakers. And we will begin with a digital presentation by Professor Cass Sunstein, who is Robert Wamsley University Professor at Harvard. And he is also the founder and the director of the program on behavioral economics and public policy at Harvard Law School. So, without further ado, I will leave the digital word and screen and, and space to uh, Cass Sunstein. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And I've improvised in the sense that I have remarks that are a little more foundational than I had expected. They are uh, connected with the idea of a garden for the poor. Um, the name of the remarks is Noise and Bias. And uh, we have to talk a little bit about the difference between noise and bias. So imagine you have a scale and you're interested in weighing a little less than you do. And suppose the scale consistently describes you as heavier than you actually are. It is a cruel and unkind scale that shows you as heavier than you are. That is my scale, I, I should tell you, and that is a biased scale. Now suppose you have a different kind of scale, a scale that shows you as a little heavier than you actually are on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, but a little lighter than you actually are the rest of the week, or let's suppose on some weeks it's random, where on some days you're shown to be heavier than you actually are, and other days you're shown to be lighter than you actually are. That is a noisy scale. So we're talking actually not about scales, but about judgment. And this might be judgment of people who are trying to eat healthy, or it might be judgment of doctors or it might be judgment of medical professionals of multiple kinds. And there are two sources of mistaken judgment. One is bias, which is systematic error, and the other is noise, which is variability. If this seems a little abstract, let's notice, shall we, that recent data suggests that an algorithm outperforms doctors in deciding when to test patients for heart problems. And that's a very important um, finding because sometimes doctors don't test patients even though they need to be tested because they have a serious heart problem that could be helped were they tested. The algorithm will say test, the doctor will say don't test, that's a mistake. In a number of cases, the doctor will um, test and the algorithm will say don't test. And that's also a big problem because for a patient to be tested is anxiety producing and not fun. And it also costs money to do the tests. Okay, the question is when people make mistakes and people in this case are doctors, what kind of mistake are they making? And bias is playing a big role. One bias is about salience, and I hope you'll be able to think of examples in the domain of healthy eating where salience really matters. If a patient presents who is, let's say, 70 years old and complaining of chest pains, the doctor might well say, 70 years old, let's test. The algorithm might well say, 70 years old, but a very active tennis player, and uh, no other reason to think there's a particular heart problem, don't test. So the doctor shows a bias called saliency bias. There's another bias the doctor shows, which is called um, representativeness, representativeness bias, where if a patient presents with chest pains, the doctor will say, let's test a lot, and the algorithm will say, well, a lot of chest pains have nothing to do with heart disease, so maybe let's not test. That's not to say that the algorithm will be indifferent to chest pain. It will be attentive to chest pain. It's just the algorithm will not overweight chest pain. Okay, doctors are like the bias scale with respect to health in the sense that they overweight age, 
demographic information, and they overweight immediate symptoms. But there's another problem, which is algorithms are not variable. If someone shows up at two in the morning or at three in the morning or at nine in the morning, the algorithm will say the same thing. Doctors are noisy in the sense that what they will do with a patient presenting with a potential heart issue very much depends on what day it is, what their mood is, who they are, what their preferences are with respect to treatment, which is to suggest that hospitals are really noisy and noise is a source of error. Okay, bias has charisma in human judgment. Bias is a little like Elvis Presley when he was young and charismatic, and bias is a little like Taylor Swift nowadays. You kind of can't keep your eyes off bias when you're thinking about health. Noise lacks charisma. Noise is like the character in a Hitchcock movie or a modern mystery that you never noticed until the last scene, and it turns out that noise is the killer. So think of noise as a much subtler problem, a much less uh, arresting and magnetic performer, but with respect to judgment involving health and food, and judgment very broadly, noise is often the villain of the piece, the real evildoer. Okay, I'm gonna say a little bit now about bias and what to do with it, and then I'm gonna say a little bit about noise and what to do about that. Um, in terms of bias in the domain of health and healthy eating, we know the following things really matter. The first is present bias by which people focus on today and tomorrow in their eating habits and not on the long term. They often think of the future as a foreign country, let's call it later land, and they're not sure they're ever going to visit. St. Augustine said, God give me chastity tomorrow. And with respect to health-related judgments, present bias is often Augustinian in that sense. God give me healthy eating tomorrow. Second bias is optimistic bias, by which we know that human beings, and this is a good thing, tend to be on average unrealistically optimistic. 90% of drivers in one study think they're better than the average driver. 94% um, of college professors believe that they're better than the average college professor. 100% of people believe, I think, that their sense of humor is better than the average sense of humor. And with respect to health risk, unrealistic optimism can create uh, serious blunders in terms of consumption and other choices. A third bias, let's call it availability bias, which is related to salience, salience bias in which people's judgment about probabilities are often affected by what readily comes to mind, what's cognitively available. And we know that doctors are vulnerable to availability bias. If a physician sees a condition in a patient on Tuesday morning, they're more likely to test for that same condition on Tuesday afternoon which can create mistakes with respect to medical judgments. We know that people show self-serving bias also. They tend to think that what they want to happen or what would be in their interest to happen is likely to happen. That can distort judgment as well. And the status quo is often uh, attractive, which means to get people to change a habit is often really difficult because the status quo is like a rock that you can't easily move out of your own way. Okay, we now have a panoply of features of the human species that are relevant to food choices. Present bias, optimistic bias, availability bias, self-serving bias, and status quo bias. There isn't an acronym for those things, but they are singly in combination, a foundation at least, of uh, less than optimal choices with respect to health writ large and food in particular. 
Um, there are a lot of things that can be done about these things. And let's notice that the categories are two, educative and architectural. Of these two categories of responses, let's say two biases in our species, the architectural are the more effective typically. If it's the case that a social environment is architected such that the healthy choices are the easier choices, then the likelihood that people will make the easier choices often jumps dramatically and sometimes stunningly dramatically. There's a recent report from the Biden-Harris administration on exactly this subject, where architectural interventions that create an enabling environment for people by making the healthier choice the easier choice have pride of place. There's work from Germany in the 1930s from a psychologist named Kurt Lewin, who urged that in the face of a problem, we often think, how do we push people in a direction that will make them make better choices? And he said, it's often preferable to think, why aren't they doing it anyway? And to remove the obstacle. Architectural responses to suboptimal choices are often removing the obstacle. The ed ed educative interventions in response to bias are also straightforward. They might be warnings, they might be information disclosure, and the sleeper educative intervention consists of repeated reminders, which if they aren't annoying, can be very effective in altering conduct. Okay, let's switch to noise, shall we? Where it turns out that wherever there is judgment, there is noise which is to say that human beings are often like that uh, mischievous scale, as opposed to the evil scale, in which they will make one food choice, let's say on a Monday and another on a Tuesday, not necessarily because of uh, a, cho a choice for variety, but just because of randomness in their assessments. Noise, it turns out, falls in three categories, and I think the the most interesting one is not the most important, but it is the most interesting. Let's call it occasion noise, where occasion noise just means that if you're in a good mood, let's say because it's a sunny day, you might make a different choice from if you're in a grim mood because it's a dark and dreary day. You might think I'm gonna have chocolate and brownies and fudge and also pie because it's a dreary day and you need something to make yourself feel a little bit better. And if it's a sunny, bright day, it might uh, prime in your mind a sense of sports and health, and you, you might go for the salad and the fruits. With respect to medical judgments, we know that mood matters for doctors, uh, a source of noise where if doctors are feeling tired or upset, their decisions with respect to healthcare will be different from what they will do if they're feeling excited and upbeat and energetic. There's a second kind of noise that I think uh, is instructively brought to bear on health choices and food choices. And it's called level noise. And the idea here is not within the person, but across people, people have different levels of judgment. I have to be a little more specific about this. You might have a judge, a literal judge, who when confronted with a criminal will be very severe, and another judge, a literal judge, who will be very lenient. They have different levels. You might have someone who for one or another reason has a level of, let's say, severity with respect to certain kinds of choices, and another will have a level of leniency. It might be they will err on the side of vegetables and low calorie and less sugar. And these are differences across people. So there will be noise across people. These are systematic differences. We observe often pattern noise, which is to say not level noise, not a systematic difference between who's low and who's high, but someone might show a different pattern of choices for lunch, for breakfast, and for dinner, or might show a different pattern with respect to fish versus vegetables as compared to meat versus vegetables. And that is often a location of noise in personal life. Okay, with respect to what's wrong with bias and noise, I think it's straightforward for bias and less so for noise. 
with bias, the problem is systematic error. So you're getting people who are making poor decisions by their own lights because, let's say, of disregard of the future or unrealistic optimism about health. With noise, the problem is a little subtler. It's that the errors add up. So if you have a scale that shows someone as heavier than they are half the time and lighter than they are half the time, the errors don't cancel out, the errors add up. In life, with respect to food choices, errors add up. And that can mean that they are cumulative rather than uh, canceling each other out. Okay, uh, now we turn to what I'm going to call decision hygiene, which is an effort to describe an assortment of strategies that work often to counteract bias and noise at the same time. And this is, as you probably can tell, work that's been done on judgment generally by yours truly with Daniel Kahneman and Oliver uh, Olivier Sibony. And what we're trying to do, and what I'm trying to do in these remarks, is bring this to bear on food choices and on health generally. One of our principal domains where we find noise as well as bias is in medical decisions. Okay, what might be done in terms of decision hygiene? The first and most straightforward is guidelines. So we know that when there are guidelines for judgment, bias and noise often are reduced very dramatically. The reduction on noise, I think, is straightforward. The reason there's a reduction on noise is the guideline just cancels out unwanted variability or reduces it. If the guideline's a good one, it will also serve to reduce and maybe to eliminate bias. So take guidelines as deserving pride of place in the repertoire of decision hygiene strategies. A second approach is to use the wisdom of crowds to aggregate a bunch of independent judgments about something. It might be about healthcare, it might be about uh, food choices, and to take the average. Now, it might be that the group is pervasively biased, in which case the average won't be so good. But if you reduce noise, that's a positive. And if you've got the right call activity, the wisdom of the crowd will be helpful in reducing uh, both variance within, across people and bias uh, within individuals. It's also the case that what we can frequently do with respect to choices, is to try to sequence information and delay the use of intuition. Now, this is a little cumbersome with respect to uh, food choices, but with respect to judgment generally, if we go right to our intuition first and then follow it, we will often get bias and, and um, noise moving to the fore. Okay, that's a, so a few notations about decision hygiene. I'm going to end with a little framework, which has an acronym that suits this occasion particularly uh, precisely. And if you remember anything from these remarks, I hope it will be this. It's called the FEAST framework. And what the FEAST framework is designed to do is to capture decades of work on behavior in order to signal strategies that might be to help. Uh, the FEAST framework has as its Olympic gold medal winner E, which is easy, the word is easy, and the reason that's the Olympic gold medal winner is connected with some of my remarks earlier that the architectural solution to an unhealthy food situation often consists of making the healthier choice the easier choice. The silver medal winner in the Olympiad for the Freeze Framework is S for social. And we know that if people learn that most people are doing X, most people are choosing, let's say, the salad and not the fudge, that tends to create a self-fulfilling prophecy. And more intriguingly, we know that if there's an emerging norm, in favor of choosing the salad rather than the fudge. People are more likely to choose the salad than the fudge. This is, I think, an exciting line of research suggesting if the norm isn't the right one yet, to signal that it's the emerging norm can often be very impactful. We don't know exactly why. It might be that people don't want to be on the wrong side of history. 
So that's the S for social in the FEAST framework. Um, the A is for attractive. And if things induce a positive affect in the sense that the food makes people smile rather than grimace and feel delighted rather than uh, scorned, then the likelihood that they will make the relevant choice increases dramatically. The T in the feast framework is for timely. And in the direction, in the domain of health and food choices, often relevant information is conveyed just at the time when it's least relevant to people. It's relevant information, but it's conveyed at the time that's least relevant. To find those times in choices or habit formation is crucial. Uh, so now you have the EAST framework, E-A-S-T. Uh, the last letter is F, and it's a stream of research that's the most recent of the five, and it's for fun. And the basic idea is for food choices, we're learning increasingly that if people find the relevant choice fun, the likelihood that they will make that choice increases dramatically. I'm gonna give three little examples, one of which is data. Pepsi, one of which is rigorous data, they're all data. The, the Pepsi markets in some countries, Pepsi Max, in some countries it markets Pepsi Diet Pepsi, in some countries it markets both. Pepsi Max often outperforms Diet Pepsi. Why is that? Because Pepsi Max makes people smile and then think diet, healthy. Diet Pepsi makes people nod and then think maybe it tastes good also. Leading with max rather than diet seems to be uh, helpful for choices. Amazon markets a product, a set of products, as, as coming in frustration-free packaging. Frustration-free packaging, that makes people smile. That's fun. Frustration-free packaging is actually green packaging. It doesn't involve plastics or recycle anything you need to recycle. It's just there. It's almost nothing. You open up the package, there's the thing. No solid waste. The idea of frustration-free packaging is marketed as a fun thing for consumers rather than as a worthy or earnest thing for consumers. The data example involves a study from Stanford about eating vegetables. If they're marketed as healthy, you get in a randomized trial a 14% increase in consumption. That's good. If they're marketed as delicious, you get a 27% increase in consumption. That's great. The suggestion is the F in the FEAST framework is the uh, most overlooked, I think, in terms of current efforts. And the uh, potential gains are massive from inducing a sense of joy and pleasure rather than a sense of commitment and uh, earnestness. Um, bias and noise are both contributors to poor choices. Bias is the most obvious, noise is the uh, least obvious, but if we can counteract both, the number of life years we can give to members of the human race, uh, the sky is the limit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sunstein. And I believe that if we all turn and wave, you can see us. Is that correct, tech people down there? Because they did that in the workshop in here, because I think he only sees us uh, from that. So we thank you by that and wish you a, a great day. Thanks to you. Thanks for having me.